As we come into this new week of trading, energy stocks are up so far this year. They are trailing several other TSX subgroups. The price of oil itself, as measured through WTI in the United States, is largely traded in, call it a $10 U.S. range. There will likely be some chatter on the outlook from here this week out of London, the International Energy Week gathering taking place. Meanwhile, our next guest recently returned from Saudi Arabia to gauge the energy dialogue there. Eric Nuttall is a partner and senior portfolio manager at Nine Point Partners, he joins us here at the studio. Welcome back. Thank you. Well, what was the conversation like? It was phenomenal. I always love yeah. traveling to that area of the world. The energy literacy is much, much higher than uh, places like Canada, where we talk about you know, energy transitions and whatnot. So I'd say people are very optimistic on uh, the macro setup for oil. There's so, still some concerns about the broader economy and what that means for, for demand and whatnot. But yeah, it was, a, it was a very good conversation. And it was good to contrast the approach, especially lo much of the conversation centered around the energy transition. And to contrast countries like Canada versus a country like Saudi, both blessed with an abundance of resources, but both taking very, very different approaches towards a long-term decarbonization route. What's the difference? Well, they're getting it right, we're getting it wrong. Hmm. Uh, like in Canada, we think we're going to solve the, the, the climate crisis by taxing farmers to use natural gas to dry their crops. In Saudi, what they're doing is they're, they're promoting oil and natural gas production, knowing that the demand will can be there for decades ahead and leveraging the resource that that offers to then invest in technologies such as carbon capture and utilization and storage and whatnot. So it's just a much, much smarter uh, approach that they're taking versus what Canada is right now. The other big thing in the energy market these days is just demand versus supply. Now, you've been pretty skeptical of those who are calling out demand woes. Mm -hmm for 2024. What was that dialogue like <laughs> on your trip? There was broad unity in view that the IEA, which is essentially consensus, most, most brokerage firms Wall Street, B Street used IEA projections. There was a broad recognition that they've been politi uh, politicized. Um, even Macron over the weekend said it's an arm of, to get our waves, eventually just to sh slam the, the climate narrative down the throats of, of most. So they are very, very pessimistic on demand. I think they're calling for roughly 1.2, 1.3 million barrels per day of growth this year. Uh, OPEC, which has a, a much, much better track record of forecasting demand, they're closer to 2.3 to 2.4. So I think there's just there's concern that too many people are listening to a, a, an organization that no longer serves its original purpose. But people are optimistic. What we see is a counter a seasonal draws in inventories, with global inventories falling when they normally uh, rise. We're emerging soon out of peak turnaround season for refineries, so we get an inflection in demand. We see growth forecasts from U.S. shale companies, further consolidation pointing to much, much slower growth this year than years past. So I think we suffer from a sentiment problem, not a fundamental problem. We've talked to that before. There's, the market's just infatuated with these three false narratives that demand is weak, U.S. shale is surging, and OPEC cohesion is faltering, and Saudi's going to have to teach the shale companies a lesson. My takeaways from visiting with the decision makers in that area of the world is each of those three narratives remain false. At the same time, last time you were on, we were talking about M&A, and there has been a pretty loud North American message that some of the biggest players that are based here are betting on the North American energy economy. Uh, and we even just saw Enterplus, which I think we talked about last time, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, getting acquired as well. I think the, the one thing that our audience is always curious about is what's, the, what's, what's, what's this all going to mean for the appetite for energy stocks, mm -hmm. where in uh, Canada, it's something like 70% of the TSX is directly tied to that group. It's like, call it 3 or 4%. You would know yes. better than I do. Yeah, it's around 5%. Yeah. So the U.S., we're all NVIDIA, NVIDIA, NVIDIA. Here right. we're, we're trying to see, <laughs> can the energy group, if, this, if the consensus changes, yes. Can, can all of a sudden that, that help the broader market? So what's your general view right now? I think the setup for energy stocks remains very, very positive mm -hmm. because the, the backdrop fundamentals for oil, less so for natural gas, but at least for oil, remain very, very positive. And it's interesting, the, the M&A that we're seeing, I think, is a function of poor sentiment where companies must get bigger to gain relevance, to go on, on the ideas list of the generalist investor that is only going to own two or three names. Mm. And so we're seeing that consolidation. Further, it supports my belief that the era of U.S. shale hypergrowth is over. These shale companies have inventory challenges. And so when you merge, you get cost energies. You get to fire a lot of people and save money. But you also elongate that runway. And that runway is a lot shorter than I think people believe. Increasingly, it's going to bring sentiment and interest back to Canada, where we're blessed with an abundance of resources.
Good to see you, Eric. Thank you. Eric Nettle joining us. We're going to take a quick break. Opening bells are next.